Hey everyone, it's Colin, how's it going? So, a little bit more casual, laid back of a video for you this time. I've got this portable SSD. It connects through USB Type-C, and it's a few years old, but it just spontaneously died on me the other day, which is, as you can imagine, really frustrating, because this thing wasn't cheap. It was well over a hundred bucks back when I bought it. Thankfully, there wasn't any data on here that I really cared about. I kind of have just been using it as like a bigger, faster USB flash drive, but it got me wondering like, what happened to this thing? I was using it one day and it was working fine. I unplugged it, put it back in the drawer, pulled it out another day, and it just wouldn't get recognized by anything I plugged it into. I tried multiple cables across multiple computers, both Windows and Mac, and nothing I plugged it into would even detect that this thing was hooked up. There's a little hole on the end here where there's normally a blue LED that lights up. That wouldn't even light up. So there's something seriously wrong inside this drive. It's well out of warranty. So I'm curious, one, what's inside this? And two, can we figure out maybe what happened to this? I was a little surprised to see that this drive failed. I mean, it just, it happens, right? It's just technology, but Lexar is slash was a reputable brand, especially at the time when I bought this because it was back when Micron owned them. Since then, Micron kind of sold Lexar off and it's under different ownership now. I have no idea about the quality of their modern products, but looking at the enclosure, the size and shape, this thing is made entirely out of metal um all the way around and then there's just these plastic end caps and they definitely use the enclosure as a heat sink because sometimes when i'd be doing like big data transfers to or from this unit it would get physically fairly warm but with the size and shape of this i'm kind of wondering if there isn't maybe like an m sata ssd inside here just connected to a bridge board if that's the case, it's entirely possible, since this thing isn't being recognized at all, that the MSATA SSD, if there is one in here, actually works fine, and it's just the bridge board components that may have failed. So I think the next task is gonna be to figure out just how do we crack into this thing? It appears to be all glued together, of course, and it's a pretty tight seam in here. So I have a feeling that going in with the, uh, the utility knife somehow and trying to like pry this up is gonna be my best option. I just gotta be really careful. You know, obviously it's a knife and I don't really wanna cut myself. Okay, this is actually a lot thinner of material than I was expecting. It's almost like it's just a plastic sticker. Okay. And there's a couple screws in there. Let's get the screwdriver out. So the screws are out, but that plastic thing's fairly tight gap. I have a feeling I actually have to get the knife going again. Let's see if there's some way that I can pry that out. I don't know if the black plastic thing is just a cover or if it's actually like part of the enclosure or like attached to the bridge board maybe. I'm thinking let's try pulling the uh, sticker off the other end too and see uh, see what we get. Maybe there's some screws under here that I got to get out as well. So there's screws on both ends. Maybe this is one of those you have to like push it through one end and out the other. Okay. So that one just came off. The other side was a lot tougher. Oh, now we're getting somewhere. Spud your time. All right, moment of truth. What's inside here? Yeah, that is just one solid, pretty solid piece of metal. So what? is under here. Is there an MSATA SSD under here? Oh no. There is not. But this is still fairly interesting. Let's um 
Let's take a closer look at what's on this board. Okay, so this thing's actually kind of interesting. Not necessarily in terms of the technology that was used. There's really nothing groundbreaking going on here, but rather in terms of the packaging and how they put all of this together, and especially the whole value engineering component, being able to do all of it at a certain price point. Perhaps the most interesting part of this entire thing is the controller. This is a silicon motion part, so Micron didn't manufacture this themselves. But what I found interesting, looking up the data sheet for this chip, it's only capable of SATA 3 performance. Now, this whole SSD has a USB Type-C port on it, and it's rated for USB 3 speeds. However, I would only ever be able to get like a few hundred megabytes per second out of this SSD reading or writing, and that always seemed kind of weird to me. I figured, well, you know, maybe they just use lower grade flash memory or something like that, and that certainly could be part of the case, but the controller definitely also holds it back. This is not an NVMe kind of design. This is more or less a SATA SSD that's been re-engineered onto its own PCB and connected through USB. And that's actually done through this chip. This is an AS Media, basically SATA to USB bridge. There may be a performance bottleneck imposed by this chip too, but having just a SATA 3 controller behind it, well, it's not gonna make a huge bit of difference. Some other interesting things to note, this is a RAM chip, and this actually was made by Micron because they're a very prolific RAM manufacturer. And so this is gonna serve as cache for the SSD, but there's also an unpopulated section here for another one of these chips. And also, there's another unpopulated section for chips here, and this is gonna be for a flash chip. Speaking of the actual flash, it's not a Micron part. I kind of would have expected them to just go raiding through their catalog of parts that they make in-house, but this isn't. And I think it also explains why I was able to buy this 512 gig SSD for about a hundred bucks. It's because of the whole value engineering thing. They went through and found parts that made sense, not just electronically, but also financially in order to engineer this thing to beat down to a certain price. So the SATA 3 controller, and then also third-party flash memory. Now, the unpopulated pads, both for the additional flash and the RAM, suggest that this same PCB was used for different capacity models. I think there was also a one terabyte version as well. So there's gonna be another one of these chips on the backside, and we'll take a look at that in a second. But if they wanted to just turn this into a one terabyte SSD, well, stick two more flash chips on it, one on this side, one on the other, and then to accommodate the, ad the additional flash storage, just throw another RAM chip on there too. So let's just go ahead and check what's on the other side of this board. Looks like there's just some clips that hold it into this plastic frame. So yeah, here's the back side, and like I expected, there's the pads for an additional flash memory chip. There's the second one, so this is 256 gig, and this one's 256 gig. What I think is most surprising to me is the fact that this is actually its own discrete PCB. Like, it's a custom design just for this. I was expecting, like I said at the beginning of the video, that they might have used an MSATA SSD. And that's because I think these portable external solid state drives that connect like through USB, they exist in kind of a weird place in the market in that, you know, they're meant to kind of replace a standard USB flash drive, but they're a lot more expensive. Yes, they are much faster, but I think the average person who needs a USB flash drive isn't necessarily gonna care so much about performance as they are about either portability or cost. People lose USB flash drives all the time, and so it's a lot easier to justify spending like 20 to $30 on one, knowing that, yeah, it's gonna be a little bit slower, but if you lose it, you're out way less money, then dropping like $100 on one that of course is gonna perform better, but it's a little bit bigger, and if you lose it, well, that's 100 bucks that you're out. 
So these, I think, are really more of kind of an enthusiast type of thing, which is why I figured they'd go for a more low volume type of approach and just build a more basic PCB with an MSATA SSD on top of it. So why did this thing die? Well, I can't say for certain, but I've got a little bit of a theory. I can't find anything physically wrong with this, right? Like no cracked solder joints or obviously blown up components or anything like that. One of the first things you might consider with a device like this would be the connection. And I looked closely at the USB-C port and none of the pins are broken off or bad solder joints or anything like that. I certainly don't ever remember damaging this SSD or like tweaking the plug when it was in there. In fact, I don't think this thing has ever even left the house, but when we took it apart, I found this piece of foam stuck to the top side with the RAM, the flash chip, and the controller. And this is just a piece of foam with some adhesive on the back. It doesn't really have any good thermal conductivity properties to it. But when we popped the PCB out from this plastic carrier, we found a thermal pad on the bottom. But the thermal pad rests in the carrier and doesn't really connect to the outside of this carrier, right? So it doesn't make any physical contact between this and the enclosure. That's the bottom though. Like there's literally just one flash chip on the bottom that would be getting some heat sinking through this thermal pad, a negligible amount because the thermal pad itself isn't really gonna do a ton of heat sinking. It just transfers the heat energy into something else. So why do they put a piece of foam on the top to cover the parts that actually do generate the most heat, like the RAM and one of the flash chips and the controller, even the USB bridge chip is all gonna generate heat. Why didn't they put thermal pad on the top? Two theories. One, either they weren't paying attention when they engineered this, which I would kind of find that hard to believe, or two, maybe it's actually planned obsolescence. Like maybe after a certain amount of time, they realized that one of these chips would actually kind of cook itself if it didn't have enough thermal management to it. And with an aluminum enclosure on the outside with proper heat sinking, this thing would run really, really cool. And I did remember feeling this thing get fairly warm when I used it, but it didn't get hot. So that kind of suggests to me that perhaps this thing just wasn't cooled properly and one of the chips failed due to overheating. I had been using it for a while prior to the last time that I put it away. I mean, I wasn't like transferring tons and tons of data on and off of it continuously, but I was transferring probably, I don't know, maybe 50 gigabytes worth of files onto this thing before unplugging it from the computer and putting it away. So it did get fairly warm in the process. I mean, maybe that was enough to just kind of tip it over after four years of fairly regular but non-abusive type of use. If that's the case, that sucks. <laughs> I mean, one would expect that with a relatively, you know, light duty cycle to it like that, and with some thermal management already in here, like this thermal pad, that this thing would have lasted longer, but that's what's in this thing and why I think it died, which is a bummer, but you know, you know this is technology, so it just kind of is what it is. Anyway. If you like this one, I'd appreciate a thumbs up. Be sure to subscribe. You can follow me on social media at thisdoesnotcomp. And as always, thanks for watching.